Hello! Today's stories come from r slash petty revenge. Ooh, four stories from one of my favorite subreddits that always delivers on funny Reddit stories. Our first story is titled, Neighbors Used My Property As Their Own, Paid For New Fence. I recently bought a house and have been having some work done before I move in. It was empty on the market for about six or eight months before I bought it. One morning, I got a call from my contractor asking me about moving the cars in the driveway. And of course, I had no idea what he was talking about. I hadn't moved in yet. I left my job site and drove nearly a half hour to get there. As soon as I arrived, the people on the east side of me were walking toward the cars. I asked if they were their cars and they said yes. They told me that they had been parking there for a few months with permission from the owners. I informed them that I was the new owner and they can't park there any longer. We went back and forth and with the intention of being a good neighbor and trying to show some goodwill, I agreed to allow them to park there for a few more weeks until I move in with the agreement that they would move them by 6 a.m. every morning. The rest of the week went by without incident. The contractor called me about scheduling a walkthrough on Saturday and we set a time for early afternoon. When I arrived, there were four cars in the driveway and nowhere to park. The only on-street parking is two blocks away. I called them and asked them to move their vehicles, reminding them of our agreement. After 20 minutes, they finally came out and moved them. Speaking with them, they claimed to have misunderstood and thought our agreement only referred to weekdays and not weekends. I corrected them and moved on. Sunday morning, I grabbed a trailer and loaded some furniture to take over and store in the garage. Once again, there were cars in the driveway. I called them and got voicemail. I texted and said they had until a tow truck could arrive to get them moved. No answer. I called a tow company. 45 minutes later, two tow trucks showed up, backed in, and hooked up to the cars. All of a sudden, the neighbors were home. They ran out to stop their cars from being towed, and it ended up costing them a little over $300 to get them unhooked. I called my contractor and asked if he knew someone who could put in a driveway gate, and he did. I let the neighbors know that they could no longer use my driveway. On Wednesday, I get a call from the gate installer telling me that there are cars in the driveway. I called them and said tow trucks are on the way. They moved. The gate was installed and I went by to pick up the opener that evening. The neighbor husband came out to confront me and I opted to just call the police department and deal with it legally. That Saturday, I went by to accept an outdoor furniture delivery and check on things when I noticed a towel beside the pool and a small kid's flotation device. My initial thought was that I just hadn't noticed it before, so I wrote it off and threw them both in the trash. On Saturday, the movers arrived with everything, and we began moving things in. About 7 p.m., my daughter and I left to go grab some dinner, arriving back at the house around 9.30 p.m. The neighbors were in my pool. They were hanging out and using my furniture. When I opened the door and began raising all heck, they told the kids to go to the house, and the children ran to a corner of our fence and just walked through. They had cut out the privacy fence so it could be removed and had been using the pool at their leisure for who knows how long. Again, I called the police and filed a complaint. The dad was arrested for trespassing, DPP, and an outstanding warrant, and the oldest boy, a 20-year-old male, for an outstanding warrant. I replaced the fence with a new one because they had destroyed the posts, runners, and pickets by removing and reinstalling the panel. Small claims awarded me the total cost of 83 feet of 8-foot privacy fence, which came out to $3,800. The following Monday morning around 5 a.m., their cars were parked in the street where there's no street parking, so I made a phone call. They were gone when I left at 7 a.m. I haven't been paid yet, but I did notice a for rent sign in their yard this morning, so that's just as good. Good riddance. Edit update. One. For those of you suggesting a security system, one was installed that next week, along with six cameras around the house, a ring doorbell, and a fence around the pool itself to keep the dogs and my grandson out of it. I'll be closing and covering the pool in the next few weeks. Two, met the owner of the house yesterday evening. The house will be empty by the end of the week. They were evicted for non-payment of rent, 
likely due to tow charges and the husband not working because he was incarcerated, where he remains. Warrant was for back child support. Wife apologized and claimed that she was told they had permission to use the pool. They didn't. Three, the material for the fence was purchased through my company account. I'm a structural engineer and commercial construction manager for a large local general contractor. Only two posts had to be replaced and a handful of runners. The rest was just eight foot one inch by six feet half an inch pressure treated pickets, which cost me $2.60 per stick times 210 pickets purchased. The rest was labor and fasteners. So altogether, about $900 for material and stain, $150 for a dumpster, and the rest went toward labor to finish it on a weekend. Fun fact, I'm also a property investor flipper. Been in construction, commercial, civil, industrial, and residential for 35 years. Not my first fence, nor my first butthole neighbor. Before the paint experts jump on board, I know how long I have to wait before pressure washing and staining the fence. Four, the petty was only my twisting the knife by having their cars towed from the street when they weren't affecting me at all. And I thought the worst would be them parking in the driveway without permission. Never mind cutting the fence and using his pool. I really shouldn't be surprised by such things anymore, but alas, I am. Let's jump to the comments, which rightfully call out the incomprehensible behavior of OP's neighbors. Salt Pepper Sugar Blah said, You dodged the worst neighbors ever. At first, I thought they were inconsiderate. Now I'm convinced they are just trashy. Make way for doodles added, This descended straight into criminal. Sensual Pie said, I'm just glad it didn't descend to violence, but if they had warrants, they were probably trying to avoid extra attention. Rob T. Firefly said, If they were trying to avoid extra attention, they could have done less crime at their new neighbor. Violet Overcast shared, How ridiculous. The level of entitlement some people have is astounding in all the worst ways. Reboot82 added, Especially when you have an outstanding warrant. Idiots. Sanctimonious said, There's a surprisingly, well, perhaps unsurprisingly, large overlap between people who have a lack of critical thinking skills and people who possess outstanding warrants. Reboot82 replied, LOL, so true, a perfect idiot Venn diagram. Dizzied Up Girl said, The driveway is one thing, and still annoying and wrong of them. But to come into your yard and use your furniture and pool? What made them think that was okay? OP replied, I guess because the pool was still being maintained and nobody was there. They decided it was free to use. I can't begin to try to understand some people and their thought process. Art Vandele said, Not much to grasp. They are crappy people and saw an opportunity to selfishly improve their lives regardless of others. Don't let the fact that your brain is wired to include sympathy, consideration, honesty, and logic to try convince you that there's more to understanding them. Our second story is short and ultra relatable to everyone that has ever braved shopping at Christmas time. The story is titled, Oh, You Want My Parking Spot? It was Christmas time and the mall parking lot was jammed. Somehow, I lucked into a space near an entrance and four hours later, my friend Dawn and I staggered back to my car with full arms and very sore feet. But we'd be home in half an hour, so the end was in sight. We got the bag stowed and we buckled in, laughing ruefully about how exhausted we were. As I began backing out, a car was slowly pulling past right behind me. Naturally, I braked to wait for the car to clear my spot, but the driver saw my brake lights and realized she'd lucked out. All she had to do was back up and let me out and my primo spot would be hers. But it couldn't be that easy. Another car was tight on her tail and that driver wanted my spot too. And neither one of them was budging. The two drivers' faces got redder and redder as they honked, revved their engines to make the other driver think they were going to plow right into their car if it didn't move, and in general made utter donkeys of themselves over the parking spot. Meanwhile, my friend and I were trapped and getting pretty mad ourselves. After more than five minutes of this craziness, motor running but going nowhere, Dawn and I had had enough. We looked at each other and smiled. Then we got out of the car, locked it back up, and waved at the two disbelieving parking warriors as we headed back into the mall 
for a much-needed drink and a bite to eat. Don't you just love it when people's idiocy bites them in the butt? Let's head straight to the comments where we'll gain some insight on the anthropological habits of these creatures in the wild. Amarame said, I went to work training at a place that had almost zero spaces for the people who work there, let alone all the trainees they had constantly, military base. If you didn't get a spot there, then you had to park in the satellite lot and walk 20 to 30 minutes. I left early to get a spot in the lot. Class always ended just before the second shifters would be coming en masse. Traffic through the lot was all one way snake through. So when I crossed the lot, I'd motion to the next car in the direction of mine and beep it with the lock a few times so they'd stop and wait. Class was several weeks. By the end of it, the same guy would see me and track me to my car every day. I'm that one guy, replied. That's some David Attenborough crap right there. The nocturnal species has formed a symbiotic relationship with its day-toiling brethren. As the day shifter completes its toils and prepares to take flight, it is spotted by its nocturnal mate. The two perform an intricate dance and the nocturnal mate following its day pair so that no space is wasted. And just like that, the day shifter leaves to feed and rest itself far from the salary territory while the nocturnal mate settles in. Mr. Ambulance Driver said, That is how it's done. I once was putting stuff in my car and a guy was waving to show I had to rush, so I decided I needed lunch. Put stuff in there and went to lunch. Lauren Dosfield said, There is a meme involving a driver sorting her things before backing out of a parking spot, another driver honking at her, and the original driver settling in with her knitting. We'll see who dies first. Our third story might be my favorite of the day. The smug pettiness of the other guy. The edit. Oh boy, just wait for it. The story's called Cut in Front of Me in the Dinner Queue. I Hope You Like Ants. A few years ago while traveling in India, I decided to try a 10-day silent meditation retreat. The retreat was out in the middle of nowhere and home to a large colony of the biggest and fiercest ants I have ever seen. As this was a Buddhist retreat, no measures were taken to get rid of them, and they were everywhere. When you turned on a tap, ants came first, then the water. That's not hyperbole. A couple of days in, my hard-earned tranquility was shattered by another meditator who felt it his right to cut in front of me while waiting for our evening meal. The bastard even had the audacity to give me a little smirk as he did it, knowing I couldn't call him out on it. I could only glare impotently at the back of his cue-jumping head. I was livid, to say the least. In the following meditation sessions, I couldn't concentrate on the practice. I could think of nothing but revenge. Luckily, I had a lot of time to think, and slowly, a plan emerged. The following day, whilst making myself a cup of chai, I surreptitiously pocketed a large handful of sugar which I later dispensed into a half-full water bottle creating a lovely syrup. At the next meditation session, I made sure I was last in line to enter the building. Before you enter the building, you remove your flip-flops and leave them outside. I made sure to mark my enemy's footwear as he removed them, and when I was alone outside, I joyfully doused them in syrup, being careful to avoid any innocent victim's shoes. After a few hours of peaceful meditation, we all began leaving the building. Doubts had started entering my mind. What if it didn't work? What if he only has sticky flip-flops? Not the worst outcome, but still. However, I was in luck. My plan had worked. His flip-flops were now a writhing mass of angry, sugar-fueled ants. His face was priceless. Shock, horror, complete confusion. He broke his vow of silence instantly, but it was in Hindi, so I'll never know what he said. The tone was disbelief, though. He tried vainly to gingerly pick one up, but was fended off by the gallant soldier ants with their massive jaws. He eventually found a stick with which to hook them with, but that failed as well as the ants started to climb down the stick, frightening him into dropping it. He left barefoot and perplexed. Victory was mine, and I could return to my meditation satiated. Edit. To all the people questioning my Buddhist credentials, namaste the F away. 
Oh my gosh, OP is obviously not following Buddhist principles, but it's so obvious I'm not sure why people would bother mentioning it. I mean, surely OP at least has that level of self-awareness. The story is super entertaining. Let's check out the comments where OP continues to deliver on low-key hilarity. Crab Cancer said, It is not revenge, but rather you are providing nourishment to the ants. The man sacrifices his flip-flops so that millions of other beings can live on. Is there truly no greater sacrifice? Haya's Angel Tit says, Love this take. Pepperdogger adds, The only Buddhist part of this whole post. Around My Corner says, I will never get people skipping cues. Chairboy replies, If you are unencumbered by empathy, it's a winning move because you get the thing you want more quickly most of the time. We hope for karma to correct these situations, but the universe does not often cooperate. Impressive Pepper says, Revenge at a Buddhist retreat seems like you've missed the point. OP replies, Yeah, totally. Turns out I'm not monk material. Our last story returns to the parking and waiting your turn theme, but takes a small detour to r slash neighbors from heck with Left for work this morning. Neighbor demanded I park in my driveway so that she could have more room in the morning waiting on the school bus with her child. Said child is at least in middle school because that's the bus that runs the time I'm leaving for work. And I would know as I taught at the middle school in the district the last three years before moving to a new one. First, I hate bus stop parents. Why? Because they litter. They just toss trash out their windows into our lawn like they own the place. They also wait outside our house with their music blaring, and they're always out at the bus stop 15 to 20 minutes early. Then, they block your mailbox or driveway with their cars. So, I already do not like these people. Their kids aren't even annoying, just the adults. But we parked on the street this weekend, which is unusual for us. We did it because we are building a fence and have stuff in our driveway for it. This is the first time since I've lived here, over a year, that I've ever left my car on the street overnight. Random lady pulls up behind me and stops me as I'm loading in my things for work and says our vehicles are in the way of parents waiting on the bus for their kids. She said we should park in our driveway and leave the road open for parents. Didn't ask, just said, tomorrow these spaces will be open for parents, okay? And then just walked away. So needless to say, we will be parking on the street until further notice. My husband has two trucks, so that means even more room will be taken. Oh, gleeful emoji. Update. Parked on street. Got the stank look from same person. She drove past and looked our vehicles up and down and shook her head. She ended up parking on the main street instead. Ours is off the main street in the neighborhood, so we don't get all the traffic from people going to work. We just have a corner lot. Fun fact about one of my husband's trucks, though. It's a work truck from his company, so anytime you have to use public parking, such as street parking, you have to put a cone five feet in front and one five feet behind it per company policy, even if you're at your house. Smiley emoji. Yes, I love everything that OP is laying down here. You tell me not to use the spot in front of my house? Oh, I'll use it. And some. Also, don't these middle school children have legs? Let's head to the comments for answers, where OP explains what the deal is with parents driving their kids to take transit. Alecto said, I might be obtuse, but if the parents can sit in their car for 15 minutes, why can't they just drive their kids to school? OP replies, most parents just don't want to wait in the drop-off pickup line, which I understand, as those lines are stupid long and most people in them never look where they're going. But I almost got hit by parents in our parking lot multiple times trying to get from my car into the school building. Our principal almost got hit a couple of times just directing the traffic out there. Sky Ripa said, I don't understand why they're in cars. Isn't a bus stop for kids in the neighborhood? OP replied, we don't understand either. They did this last year too. They just sit and wait for the bus. They do it in the afternoon too. Kids here don't usually walk to the bus stop, which is weird because I grew up one neighborhood over, went to the same school, and I walked to the stop all the time. Tuant said, I think my mom walked me to the bus stop for like the first eight days of kindergarten. Comfort Munchies replied, 
Some places you have to for K4, K5, and first grade, or the bus driver won't let them on off the bus. And most times, to get them off the bus, they give you a card you have to hold up so the driver can see it before they'll let them off the bus at all. If you've enjoyed the story and would like to hear more, consider liking, subscribing, and leaving a comment. Thanks, and bye for now.